Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew, Associate Editor of Audioholics, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant, the show where we answer your questions about home theater and all things audio video. And last week, we had three people whose questions we ran out of time for. Our apologies to Matt Damon and those three people. Um, this week, we didn't get like a ton of questions like we often do, but we still got quite a few. And actually, Tom has a large review that we're going to start the show off with. So we will see how far we get this week. But rest assured, all questions will eventually be answered. Yeah, I don't know how large the review is going to be. All right, uh, okay, so before we begin, let's go ahead and talk about our listeners of the week. We've got Layton again, uh, yes, who was nice enough to donate again to the podcast to help keep us running and up and going. And Cameron, Cameron uh, uh, spells the name, or, yeah, I guess his name with a C, but uh, Cameron K. So I didn't want to say Cameron K, and everybody go, oh, he's supposed to it with a K, that's weird. No, he's supposed to it with a C, but his last <laughs> name starts with a K. So those were our listeners of the week. They went to the, to the website, www.avrant.com. They clicked on the Bias co Coffee, and they d gave us a PayPal donation, which helps support the podcast and keeps us uh, in the black and uh, up and running. We have started a few minutes early this week, and I apologize for that, but uh, whatever, dude. I, 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 was, I got in here late. so We are going to talk about a few things. First thing being, uh, to start off with, uh, we've got uh, some business. Uh, Rob's schedule may be changing in September. Is that true? It is definitely changing starting Labor Day, so right, right, okay. right there at the beginning of September. So we're going to be back on our Tuesday schedule. So we, we record our podcasts on uh, Google+, Plus on uh Right now, Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. We will go back to 9 p.m. Tuesday Eastern Time uh, because of Rob. I switched it because uh, Tuesday, it was a climbing thing. Uh, it was easier for me to climb on Tuesdays than it was for me to climb on Wednesday. I mean uh, Mondays uh, because the stupid climbing gyms closed on stupid Mondays because they stupid hate me. Uh -huh. And uh, I thought that uh, if we could switch it, it would be better for everybody. And by everybody, I mean me. Uh, well, uh, Rob's schedule has changed, which is fine. We can go back to the Tuesdays, but also on top of that, uh, I hurt my knee in the gym at the beginning of the year. I came off the wall, and uh, it kind of popped, and I limped around for a bit, and I wasn't feeling really well, and then it kind of got better, and then it popped again when I was doing something else, and then it started feeling better, and then it popped again. It happened about four or five times before I finally said, hey, go to the doctor, stupid. So uh, the uh, the whatever, the, the osteopath, is that what they're called? It was an orthopedic guy, whatever they are. The dudes mm. that do the knees. Anyways, yep. I, I went in to go Not talk sure. to him. My doctor's name is Coco because of course it is. But or some sort of chimpanzee? Yes, well, he, I, I would not say it to his face. He's a very large man with big hands and seems to be awfully strong. Uh, his name is Coco, and he is a... Uh, uh, he seemed very capable. He was fairly convinced that I had torn my ACL, but he didn't know for sure because you can't know for sure without an MRI. So this morning I got up at oh dark thirty to go get an MRI on my knee, uh, which uh, was an exciting thing for me. So that means I'll probably be off climbing for six months or so. So it doesn't make any difference when we do the podcast for me anymore. <laughs> I'm very depressed about this. I plan on being in a bad mood because of it for at least the next six months. Uh, and after that, I plan on being in a bad mood for the next... That into, the, uh, into the podcast. <laughs> I'll be in the bad mood for the next three months after that as I am incredibly sore for going back into the climbing gym and then being uh, frustrated by how poorly I'm climbing after six months off. Mm -hmm. So I've got a lot of irritation ahead of me. Um, so I, I was disappointed. <laughs> I, I can't say how disappointed I was about that. I was very... I've spent my entire life not having anything broken. I, didn't, I have never broken anything. I never really. The, the, I've had uh, my wisdom teeth out and I had my appendix out, and that was it. That was my whole life. And now I've got a torn ACL, so now I feel old. Uh, anyways, if you want to get in contact with us to an ask us some questions about your uh, home theater AV, uh, qu I guess qualms or questions or uh, uh, problems or troubleshootings or just general curiosity, uh, you can send one to uh, rob at avrant.com, tom at avrant. You can come to the website. You can go to facebook.com slash avrantpodcast and ask which people were doing during the podcast last week, and their, their questions are on our list this week. Uh, let's see. You can also contact Rob at, at First Reflect and me at, at avrant underscore tom on Twitter. Is that, all? Is, that, is that all of it, Rob? 
Uh, yes, once in a while people do leave comments on Google+, and if you do that, there's a good chance I won't see it because I just realized while Tom was giving out the contact info, I completely forgot to even check Google+, Plus this week. So if anyone left a question over there, it'll have to wait till next week. We'll get you next week. Next it. Yeah, we'll get you next week. <laughs> Right. Well, I was going to grab the remote before we started the podcast so I could show it during the... Um, mm. And then I didn't. So now Why I'm not going to do that. Why should we start having visual displays now? We, we just claimed last week that we weren't going to do that. Well, I mean, when it's only like literally 10 feet away in the other room, it seems ridiculous <laughs> for me not to have grabbed it. But I didn't. You can almost see the base. It's right back there, but it's black in the big dark closet with a bunch of black equipment around it. Well... Uh, let's start with, let's just talk about some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, and the first mm -hmm. thing is going to be this uh, review of the Harmony uh, Ultimate Remote System. Uh, I believe it costs about 350 bucks, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Uh, we've got some Facebook questions, we've got some updates from some of our listeners, uh, we've got uh, some of the questions from last week is John, uh, David sent us an article uh, about uh, why speakers could be a lot better but aren't. Eliezer asks about absolute phase and phase inversion, and also talks about DAX, uh, uh, digital to audio uh, converters, or analog converters, uh, that are mostly portable. I guess he's got some of that portable and some that aren't. Are they all portable? They're all no, some, some that are portable, some that are desktop. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Uh, Travis got a question about MC, MCACC, which is the Pioneer Room Correction System. Uh, he wants to know our thoughts on that. Carlos wants uh, to stop his ceiling-mounted projector from vibrating when people walk on the floor above it. Uh, mm -hmm. mm, you do what I do. Put everybody in the room until you're done with your movie. <laughs> that's what I would do. All right, I don't know if that's a really viable thing. Anyways, Ashley uh, from Twitter has some questions about computer sound card connections and settings. Jason wants to know how to calculate required amplifier power for his speakers. Uh, Mike wants to connect an additional amplifier to his computer speakers. Good luck with that. Uh, Raul has questions about image resolution versus viewing distance. Jonathan has a Harmony question, which will probably be worked into my Harmony review. Uh, an upgrade question and a mini rant. Uh, and he's at the very end of our list, so good luck, Jonathan, getting that in. <laughs> now... <sighs> The Harmony Ultimate Remote is a, pretty much the top of the line from Harmony these days. It comes in basically two pieces. Well, it's got a couple extra little gadgets, but there's a hub, which is a little black saucer disc looking thing, and the remote itself, which is very small and light. Uh, it's got sort of a, it's a gloss front with a touch screen, a couple buttons up top, and a bunch of buttons on uh, below the touch screen, and then there's uh, sort of like a, almost a pistol grip underneath it. Uh, where you can like hit, hook your finger in one spot, hook your finger in another, depending on what part of the remote you're going to be using. Uh, the very top of the remote has like the play, pause, stop buttons. Then there's the um, the touch screen. That underneath are the rest of the buttons so that uh, control stuff. A lot of stuff is done via the touch screen. Uh, the hub itself uh, it sits in your room, uh, near usually near your gear. It has IR blasters kind of coming out of it. So if it's near your gear. Uh, then it will receive the signal from the remote, and then the remote will, uh, and then the, the blast, the, the 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 hub will send out the IR uh, signal to your gear. If it can't be near all of your gear, there are IR extenders which you can you, you plug in, and they're these little like uh, probably about an inch, the inch uh, long and wide, and maybe half an inch thick things that you can stick or uh, put in your room in different places or in your cabinet in different places. Yeah, and just uh, to be clear, the uh, Harmony Ultimate remote itself does send out IR commands directly yeah, out of the remote, yeah. and then it's also simultaneously sending radio frequency commands to that hub. So the hub can be like inside a cabinet that's out of view, and it'll yeah. be blasting out IR as well. So I was getting to that, but yes, it is RF from the remote to the hub, and then but IR is going on all over the place at the same time. Now, the remote itself and the hub are all on your Wi-Fi network, okay? They are all connected to your Wi-Fi network, so they can all get updates whenever needed. There's a little base uh, thing for you put, to put the remote into so that it will charge, uh, and then you plug the remote via a USB cable into your computer. You have to download an app, and then, uh, or a, I guess it's an app, uh, and then oh, you... Web app. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's sort of half, half on your computer, half on the web, <laughs> and you, uh, you pull all your gear into, you pull all your gear into the app, and then you tell it what you want it to do at what times, and then uh, it programs the remote for you. Now, 
If you think about uh, a traditional remote, traditional remote, you press a button, something happens. You press a different button, something else happens. Okay, that's a traditional remote. The complete other end of that spectrum is like a very high end universal remote system that some custom installer will do, which means you'll have some sort of touch screen or something like that. You'll say, I want you press the I want to watch DVD, the DVD button, and then your lights will dim, your projector will come on, your screen will come down, your your seats will recline, you know, the speakers will come on, the receiver will turn on, they'll turn to the right inputs, they'll select the right, you know, DSP mode, all this other stuff. Uh, it's all very high tech, all very technical, it all, it all requires a lot of programming. So where does the harmony fall in this? The harmony falls right in the middle. It falls between these two things, but closer to the to the custom install side than to the not custom install side. What you do is you plug in all your gear. It asks you what your receiver is. It asks you what your uh, what, what DVD players and stuff that you have, and it has just literally oodles and oodles and oodles of of uh, the co of codes for different pieces of gear. You're hard pressed to find some random piece of gear that it does not control. It will even control those new Wi-Fi, you know, lights, the smart lights. It'll dim your lights for you if you get those light bulbs. The Philip, I think, the, I think they're the Philips ones, but they may do it with. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it will. It will. It was almost like a whole home automation thing. And since it's on your Wi-Fi, uh, it, it's getting updates at all times. No, not all times, but they can get updates. Now, after you put all your stuff in, then it's going to start asking you. Okay, so when I, you know, what button do you want to program first? Like, I want to program the. I want to watch a DVD. So, okay, which of your gear will be turned on during? You know, be used here. I need the receiver. I need it to be on these settings or this input. I want it to be on this. You know, these different settings. I want the the the, the projection screen to be down. I want the projector to be on. I want the lights to be dimmed. Oh, okay. So it does all that stuff. Now, program your next button. Okay, Blu-ray. It's all the same except instead of that, instead of the DVD player, I'm now using my PS3. Okay, it's Bluetooth as well. So next time you turn on your PS3, it will ask you to put your PS3 in pairing mode so it can pair to it, and then it controls your PS3 as well, which is pretty awesome as far yeah, as I'm concerned. Because that Bluetooth signal is coming off of the hub. So yeah. um, you, you can't do it with just the remote itself because uh, Logitech does actually have another remote that they're they're now branding it the Har or what is it the Harmony Ultimate One, which is a weird name because they used to call it the Harmony Touch, which was probably a better name for it. And that remote physically looks just like the Harmony Ultimate remote, but it is IR only. So hmm. you got to be a little bit careful in the one you're buying because that Ultimate One is $250, and you're like, oh, wow, that looks like a great deal. It's like, uh, no, you got to be careful because that one doesn't do Bluetooth. It's only the one that comes with the hub. Yeah. So that, okay, that being said, uh, so you can do, you basically you program all your different stuff. Now, the upside is it is absolutely intuitive. The interface on this is absolutely intuitive. It is not hard. It is not something that you're going to spend hours with. I had a harder time downloading and getting the software because what would happen was I would start the software and it would start looking, you know, it would it, it was doing updates and stuff and I would walk away and I would come back and it would like, okay, well, you're gone too long. Uh, you got to start over again. I'm like, dang it. So once I got everything up and running, uh, the the the, in, the interface is absolutely intuitive. I love the remote. The remote's very light. It feels very very. Uh, it, 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 I, I like the um, the ergonomics of it. Uh, I know the buttons on the top sometimes bother some people, but there is like that sort of ridge underneath. Uh, on the bottom, sort of pistol grip ridge underneath, where if you put your finger above that ridge, perfectly centers your thumb for those buttons. If you put it below, then it perfectly centers your thumb for the touch screen, uh, and that's where those are the two places you're going to need your thumb 90% of the time. This is not some remote you have to hold in two hands. You know, it's not some remote that you go sit on and something's going to happen because when you first touch it, the screen turns on and it says swipe. You have to swipe it to, to basically activate the touch screen. So that means you can't really accidentally sit on it and have it start doing weird things. Um, uh, I think the hub system is really, really good. The, 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 to integrate that with IR blasters uh, makes it so that you can really kind of, you can you can have all your gear because I mean if you think about it, the kind of person that's going to be interested in this, they're very likely going to have their gear in one place, but one or two pieces might be someplace else. So they might be able to stick that hub in the cabinet with everything else, 
but like with me, the projector and the screen are outside of that cabinet or outside of that little, my, in my case, a closet. So I need an IR blaster that can basically be aimed towards these things in order to make sure that they work with everything else. Works really, really well. It's a very well thought out system. Um, the downsides. Uh, the the now uh, I had to ask Clint because I Clint has been using this remote for a really really long time and a lot of times with these IR remotes, uh, with these universal remotes, you don't figure out what's really wrong with them in the first couple of weeks or months of using them. It takes a while. And he's been using it almost since it came out. So his two complaints that he has is that, and this the first one is more of a power user thing, you really only, you don't have as much control as you might like. Uh, basically, there are parts of the interface where it's like, okay, you tell it to turn the receiver on and then go to this input, it's going to turn the receiver on and go, go to that input. Well, if for some reason your receiver powers up a little slower than it should, that, uh, that input is not going to be that input command is not going to be received. Okay, and there is no physical way to put a delay. There are ways to oh, put delays. There are ways. <laughs> there are ways, but there are you can't do it in certain certain points of it. You really can't. You can't. Like he has not been able to figure out a way to put in delays in the exact all the places to make it so that it would work every single time. I have something to say about that, but I'll let you continue and then I'll get all right. back to it. All right. Now, he kind of thought that you know, listen. Harmony, if you're going to make a, a change to this remote, your, your entire remote system, you need to have a learning function in your interface. So if I press help on my remote, and then you do, and then the remote does, you know, sends a, a specific command again, and I, and that keeps fixing things over and over again, and I, and I, because you basically, the way, it, the way it works, you press help, it says, what's wrong? You know, I can't see the TV, or the TV's off, or something, you press some button, and then it says, does this fix it? Well, if the same thing is fixing it all the time, then it needs to learn that and say, okay, I need to delay that that command a little bit. Um, there's nothing for that there. He is, you know, he's saying that there's certain amounts, there's certain uh, places within the interface that are gr kind of grayed out, like the top, he calls it, the, you know, the top part of the interface are grayed out, and it's really hard to get, or almost impossible for him to get a, a delay or to really adjust that too much. Uh, the other, the other r problem he's found, and this is one of those things that you would not find out right away, uh, that only happens over time, is that a like he'll set that remote down, and he'll come back a week later, and he'll have full charge just like it, like it did when he set it down. And other times he'll set it down, and an hour or two later it'll be almost dead. And there's really no rhyme or reason that he can figure out. He thinks that what's happening is that you know, within the Wi-Fi or something like that, it's getting a signal and saying, hey, hey, there's an update, hey, there's an update, hey, there's an update, hey, there's an update, and that's keeping the unit powered on, the, the remote powered on a little bit, and that's draining the battery, but he can't, hasn't been able to find the exact cause for that yet. I'm not sure that that's it, because, um, I mean, I'll just jump in here with my experience with Harmony, which is I have the Harmony 1, which was a really popular one, but they're not selling that particular one anymore. I have the is that Harmony the square one? Nope, nope. Uh, Harmony One was the. Uh, it looks exactly like the current 650, except it's larger and it's uh, got a touch screen instead of separate buttons. Uh, oh, that's what my parents have. Really my parents have the 650. Yeah, I really like the physical button layout on the One. I have the 900, which is essentially just the radio frequency version of the Harmony One. Um, it can send uh, radio frequency signals to an IR blaster, but it's not a hub. That old one. It's it's just an IR blaster that takes radio frequency controls from the remote itself. Uh, and I'm using the Harmony 650. 50, that's actually over at my parents' place. I set that up for them. So the thing with the delays <laughs> is that, um, yeah, the, this is on the newer software. On the older software that used to set up the Harmony 1 and the Harmony 900, because uh, they've, they've changed to a completely different piece of software now to do that setup. On the old one, you could insert delays almost anywhere in the signal chain, and that made things really easy. On the new one, for some reason, they won't let you insert a delay between when a device is powered on and when it selects its input. Now, and one of the really, really nice things about the Harmony software is that they'll have buttons programmed in there that don't exist on the physical remote that came with your device. So if you got an AV receiver where you have to press, say, a button that says input and then use the up and down arrows to select the input you want and then press OK, you might not have to do that with the Harmony. The Harmony might have direct commands for each one of those inputs. Yeah, discrete. They call those discrete yeah, commands. Discrete, discrete commands. So that's super nice. So 
I was thinking this happened with my parents' setup because they have a Samsung TV that takes about five seconds to turn on. So you, you press power on and you have to wait about five seconds before it can accept another command. And that's too long a period of time. The Harmony 650 that they're using has already sent the command to switch to whatever input and it misses that command because it's still powering up. So I was thinking, okay, simple enough. It won't let me put a delay in between when it powers on and when it sends the input command, but I can put a delay after the entire sequence has run through and then I'll just tell it to send the input command again. Well, for some, I have no idea why reason, when you go to do that, those discrete commands, which if you're checking just the device inside the software, those discrete commands totally show up in the list. For some reason, when you're setting up the activity, those particular commands do not show up. Well, there is a, an insane workaround which is you'd have to have another Harmony remote. You'd have to have a second one. So, I mean, this works for me because I've already got two others, so I can do this. But what you can do is program that same device onto two remotes, and then you can learn the discrete command into something that you name yourself. You give it a completely different name. You don't name it input HDMI 1, because if it has the word input anywhere in there, it'll like freak out and not show it to you when you're trying to put it into activity. But you can name it something, anything you want, you know, HD1, whatever, it doesn't matter. And now that command that you learned into it will show up in the list of possible commands when you're programming an activity. So that is an insane workaround that requires two Harmony remotes, but it can be be done. So this is one of the things about the Harmony software is sometimes to do what you want to do, you have to think of crazy insane ideas to get it that to work. But I mean, I would love for that thing that Tom was saying, if you could just press help and have it actually figure out that, oh, this is happening every time, that would be lovely. That would be absolutely That's crazy. Lovely. No, but you're, I, I, I can't imagine somebody buying a second remote just to learn right. a command. And then maybe we, what we need is like a, a, a network of Harmony users and we just like have meetups like to <laughs> learn each other's IR codes. That's now. I, like I said, I have not really experienced that part of it yet because, uh, frankly, I've just, I mean, my home theater is still being occupied by my brother. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I have played around with it a lot. I really do like the remote. I've used that Clint's. Uh, I've used it around here. I'm going to be programming it to use to, 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 for use for my, to my parents' gear that's in the front room, uh, which I will be uh, adding a receiver to and a couple of speakers to very soon. So, oh, and on the other side of this, Jonathan uh, did have a question about the Harmony One because he's got the, I think he's got the same, uh, the home Harmony Ultimate because uh, I've got the Harmony Ultimate. The one I'm reviewing is the Harmony Ultimate. The Harmony One is what you and he both have. Yeah, it's the and, older one. It was really popular. It's, it's kind yeah. of a shame that it went away, but yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, they, uh, He's just bought the Sonos system and found out that his remote will not work on the Sonos system uh, because Sonos works over Wi-Fi and a bunch of other stuff, blah, blah, blah. And his first question to me, when I, cause I, I asked people for questions about you know, if they had any, any comments, he's like, well, does this work? Does the new Ultimate work with Sonos? And in fact, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not do everything that uh, you want it to do, but it will control, do the basic controls of it, which is something it's never done before. In fact, Sonos has not been known to be controlled by anything other than Sonos stuff. Uh, you know, and their apps, their or, or their uh, you know their their iPhone and you know Android apps and that sort of thing. So at least you can get the modicum of control. I think like you control your playlist, you control you know play, pause, stop, start, all that stuff. Yeah, uh, it, do, it doesn't replace the no. um, Sonos software itself. It's not a conf uh, it doesn't configure the system the way you can yeah. through the Sonos software. But in terms of just, hey, I already have this remote in my hand. Wouldn't it be nice if I could turn on my Sonos system and control my whole house audio without having to pick up a second device? Because, I mean, you know, come on, man, first world problems. That, that would just be the death of us if we had to put down one remote and pick up another to do something. Or, or close the Harmony app on your smartphone and open the Sonos app. I mean, come on, what kind of torture right. is have two apps open at the same time. Hey, I got the stink eye today at the at the uh, the checkout because I got uh, I think I had 11, 11 items mm -hmm. in my cart when I was in a ten item or less. And this lady was just what she was just irate. She was behind me, she like, ah. and she well, got out of the line because, to go yeah, get into a different line because God forbid she have to stand behind me while somebody. I was like, I just looked at her. I'm like, 
people dying all over the world, you know, there's things that are going wrong right now. I live in Florida, literally people are taking left-hand turns from right-hand lanes constantly, mm -hmm. and you, this is what you're pissed off about. Okay. All right. If the sign yes. says ten items or less, I'd be I'd be already pre pissed off too because it really should say ten items or fewer. That's, That's just true. incorrect That's grammar, what, and you see it. What all it says over. though, this is America. So, America. Terrible. Yeah. Um. A couple of things I, I forgot to mention about that battery thing that Clint was mentioning. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is the Wi-Fi because my Harmony One and Harmony Nine Hundred do the same thing, and they ain't connected to no Wi-Fi. So. Uh, <laughs> it's there's something going on, but because he he's something, like it, there's no rhyme batteries. or reason to it. It just no. sort of happens. So. Yeah. So it's it's something to do with the battery monitor or the way it charges or discharges or whatever. So I yeah I think that's all it is is the batteries they use. Now the other really cool thing is. Um, the way Logitech is selling the Harmony lineup right now, this is something that people requested and they listened and they responded, which was um, at first when they brought out this new lineup, you could only get the hub by buying the Harmony Ultimate or the Harmony Smart Control, which is a, a cheaper version that doesn't have a touch screen. Um, people said, well, hey, I'd like, I already have like a Harmony Ultimate. I'd like to get a second Harmony Hub or I'd like to just get the hub by itself or I already have a hub and I'd like to add the Smart Control remote to it. It, or they have these um, keyboards now, mm -hmm. that, uh, like full out keyboards with a with a trackpad on there that you can use to control a home theater PC or type in things into a Roku or into one of your game consoles. And people were like, hey, I'd like to be able to get that keyboard and add it onto the hub I, I, that I already have or get them separately. So Logitech has responded. You can now get everything individually. You can get the hub by itself, the smart control by itself, the Harmony Ultimate remote by itself, or the keyboard by itself, or get them in bundles together. Um, but the cool thing is once you have one of those hubs, you can download a free app on iPhone, iPad, or any Android device, and it's a totally free app, and it basically turns your phone into a touchscreen remote control. So that's one of the reasons people wanted to be able to get the hub all by itself, because they're like, I don't want a Harmony remote. I just want the hub and then to use my smartphone as my remote entirely. And now you can do that. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, you know, and that's one of the things. I've, I've used Harmony remotes. For my, I think the 650 is what my parents have. Uh, you know, I've used them through Clint and stuff like that. I've never had one for myself. And I've never done the programming side of it. But I have done the programming side on Ultimate, uh, Universal Remote Control. Uh, that the one I did a review of a long time ago. And it was so powerful. And I really, really loved it. But one thing I've, I've always harped on this podcast and then just in general in life is that sometimes having that much power, you sacrifice so much usability that it becomes pointless. You know, uh, and in that case, that's exactly what happened. I set up that universal remote, and it was great until I got my next piece of gear, and I was like, man, forget this. But with the Harmony remote, you can literally just say, okay, I've got a new receiver. This is what it is. I want everything to stay the same. You know, I'm. this is the inputs. You might have to ch make sure you get the inputs right for your uh, whatever your devices are. But other than that, it's really, really easy, and it's that level of ease that I that I think really it draws a lot of people. And what you just uh, harped on, and, and actually what you just said, and what uh, Jonathan also kind of brought up inadvertently, which is, you know, hey, does it control this? You know, yeah, it does. But why? Because people want it to. Oh, can we buy it all individually? Yeah. Why? Because people want us to. That's what Logitech has done with, the, well, I guess what Harmony did, and uh, then Logitech. The, the, the Logitech buy Harmony, or has Harmony always been part of Logitech? No, Logitech bought Harmony. Uh, Harmony That's was right. its own company before, but but Logitech bought them. But yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're doing a good job of they are updating it. So I mean, it, you might come across some new device that you buy and your Harmony software doesn't have it in there yet. It doesn't know how to control it yet. That doesn't mean you have to throw out your system and think it'll never come. They will respond and they will update things if there's enough call for it. So yeah. you know that's really cool. I'm I wanted to mention I you know I I got the Harmony 900 because I've always preferred when I'm controlling my home theater to have a hard button remote. I, I don't particularly like having to look down at a touch screen and not having any sort of tactile feel to it. If all I want to do is change the volume, I don't want to have to turn on my device and swipe to open it and then hit soft keys on a touch screen I have to look down at just to change the volume. So, you know, stuff like that. I've always preferred a hard button remote, but I got to say one of the really cool things they've added to the uh, being able to control it with your smartphone is now we've got so many devices where it's nice to be able to search, you know, whether that's your DVR or it's a Roku box or one of the consoles or your home theater PC. 
now they have a soft keyboard that can show up on your iPhone or on your Android device. And not only that, they have a microphone button on there. So you can hit the microphone button and dictate into it, and it'll do a speech to text translation. Works a lot like the new Amazon uh, Fire. I was going to say, <laughs> they, after about five seconds after Amazon announced that, yeah. Harmony went, uh, we're doing that. For yeah. sure. <laughs> and now you can do it on other devices that don't support it natively. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's really cool. They keep adding stuff like that. It's kind of making me want to get one of these hubs now. So, yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Rob's got money in his pockets burning a hole. Not uh, really, but yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, it is an expensive remote. There's no doubt about that. You may not need the full-powered one. Uh, you know, Rob's talking about hard buttons versus soft buttons. The, Logitech, the, even their touchscreen one that they had, the square one they had, uh, that had hard button volume controls and channel controls on it, as well as a touchscreen. So they, and this one has volume controls and all that stuff as well. So I feel like they're kind of listening to a lot of, they're, they're, they're putting those controls on there that you use all the time so that you don't have to power it up. But at the same time, your, uh, you get that touch screen so that you can have that flexibility. Uh, I like it. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. It's definitely recommend. It definitely makes a recommendation, and they have enough levels of it where you're like, okay, well, I don't want the hub. I just want the little remote. I don't need any touch screen nonsense, you know. And uh, the fact that it controls the PS3 blew my mind because I remember when I was, uh, uh, it wasn't that long. I think it was for the podcast. Somebody asked me how to do that, and I was like researching it. Uh, and they have a separate add-on thing. It was like a $70 thing just yeah. to turn your old remote into a Bluetooth command. It was like... Well, it, yeah, it was an IR receiver that would yeah. plug into the... And it still was it was quirky. It never didn't really work properly. Uh, I think that's amazing that they've managed to do this, to be honest with you. I think it's absolutely amazing. So I'm excited about it. Uh, and once I get it fully integrated in my system, you're going to be t hearing a lot more about it. But uh, I think Clint, Clint and Rob already, you know, are in agreement that there are some quirks to it. But for me, the quirks, you know, if you're, you're saying, oh, well, you know, oh, why can't I put a delay in here? I'm like, listen, dude, for the, the next step up where you have, where you can put the delays everywhere. Not only can you, you have to because it will not. It, you know, it doesn't have any of this integration. Doesn't have any it of this. Configure itself automatically. You it, yeah, you don't just put in the name of your device. You know, it's a big deal. So for me, it's an easy, easy trade-off uh, that I'm happy to make. Uh, now I'm not going to go as far as Rob does uh, to do all the nonsense that he's done. But that being said, okay, now. <laughs> One thing I didn't tell you guys I was going to talk about today, and I think I'm going to save it for the end of the podcast, we're just going to talk a little bit about accommodation pricing. Okay, Accommodation pricing is something that's, uh, I think it's pretty well known if you do a little research. Uh, but uh, if you work in the industry, in any, any industry, if you think about it this way, if you're if you're a uh, 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 you know, CEO or you know, some sort of person over at uh, Ford and you want to drive a GM car, uh, you don't go to the GM lot and buy a GM car. You call GM and say, hey, I'm the CEO of Ford. I'm thinking about getting one of your cars. You know, can you help me out? And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, well, we have an, what we call accommodation pricing, which is, I don't know, you know, what the difference is in prices, you know, as far as, you know, cost versus how much profit they make, but it's, it's a lower price that they give for uh, people in the industry. Well, accommodation pricing happens in AV all the time. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're in the industry, if I work for Macintosh and I want to, buy a, a Yamaha receiver, you know, they they usually make some sort of, uh, they, they, you call them up and you get accommodation pricing. Well, uh, I've never really experienced it before. I've always heard about it. But uh, when I started talking about one of the new receiver, uh, it got kind of thrown my way that that might be something that I should look into. So I did. And now I know something about it, and I'm going to tell you about it. And it's going to blow your mind, absolutely blow your mind, Rob at the end of the podcast. All right. All right. So, well, let us race through all the updates and comments because we've burned half an hour and we have that to get through at the end and we should be able to get through these comments and yep. updates pretty quick. Let's so first of all, over at Facebook last week, we talked about our favorite speakers and our favorite demo material, which we did sort of, I did off the top of my head and Rob, of course, did a bunch of research because Rob's awesome and I suck. Uh, we posted that stuff over at Facebook and if we are looking to have you add to our lists. So feel free. I've also been thinking more about it, which I will not... Uh, Talk about right now since we've I've always already wasted a half uh, well I don't know I want to say about 15 minutes of the podcast on this remote thing. Uh, Toby, 
Updates us on his AV receiver purchase. He uh, ordered the Denon AVR X2000. Yay! After we gave him the big thumbs up to that choice last week, one thing he says that he will miss, though, are surround A and surround B speaker connections. Uh, back in the day, they used to... Uh, they would have two. They would have extra speaker connections in the back, and then you could configure speaker uh, surround A's and surround B's to be two different locations, uh, or two different types, or even zone A, zone you know, or a zone B sort of a zone two sort of thing. Uh, he's very big into surround music, and he has a four channel and eight uh, four channel eight track tape deck. Wow, rocking it old <laughs> now school. There is a legacy format. And he liked uh, to be able to have two sets of surround speakers for separate music and movie setups. Uh, you won't be able to easily do that anymore, but he's looking forward to hearing what Odyssey Multi QXT can do since he never heard it, uh, never used an autom automated uh, setup or room EQ before. And Toby, we're interested in hearing how that goes. Now, for those of you that are curious, uh, technically, if you're listening to surround music like SACDs and DVDAs that are is, uh, uh, Specifically recorded for surround, your speakers and your surround speakers are not supposed to be in the same place as your surround speakers for movies. Haha, <laughs> stupid. Yes, but true. And so what the thought was is that you could reconfigure where your surround speakers were going to be because surround speakers for movies are supposed to be right next to you and up above, and surround speakers for music are supposed to be sort of 45 degrees behind you, if I remember correctly, and pretty yeah, much yeah, in line. Yeah, and that ear level, I'm pretty much, you know, on the plane with you. So, uh, as much fun as that sounds. Uh, so, what you could do is you could wire your, both speakers up and then flip between them as you needed. And that's something that uh, I, I was actually thinking about this, Toby, today. Uh, receiver manufacturers are making these things two, three years ahead of time. So, the receivers they're making right now, they're designing right now, uh, we will see two or three years from now. That means that it took, it's taken them about you know this long or not quite this long uh, to figure out that people really weren't using it the way that they thought, meaning that they did not do what you did, Toby. But you did it, but no one else did, so they got rid of it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the thing is, thing. you can get passive speaker wire selector boxes. I yeah. mean, people they use this all the time to do um, you know A/B comparisons, where you want to be able to switch between two speakers really quickly when you're comparing them, so that you know you don't have a delay in between and your audio memory doesn't you know fade out, and so you can do a really quick transition. So you can get some of those speaker wire. Um, you know, AB selector boxes, uh, they don't have to be terribly expensive because they're literally just a physical switch that moves the connection from one set of speakers to the other. So that, that's... Provided you have the same speakers. I mean, if you're going to use completely different speakers, then you're mm -hmm. going to have to recalibrate every single time, which right. would suck. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> though theoretically, I think Odyssey has... Uh, don't they have uh, multiple uh, settings that you can remember? I don't think that you can... No, re not really. They, they have two different curves. They have a flat yeah. curve and an Odyssey curve um, or a movie and a music curve. The same they don't way. have they like user one, things. user two. But you can't like yeah, recalibrate the, each time. Yeah, the actual EQ and all that is, yeah, is only set yeah. once. Yeah. So, right. yeah, you're right. Yeah, that wouldn't work. Today. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jason found a 7.1 Blu-ray audio collection. It's a 40-disc collection of 7.1 DTS <laughs> HD Master Audio Blu-ray audio recordings. Uh, we've been talking about that on the podcast a little bit. It's over on Amazon. There was like one left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's like 150 bucks. So if you're really, really down with it, I don't a know lot where of that. Music goes. though. So <laughs> yeah, there's a ton of music on it. Uh, 40 discs. I think it might be all the music. All the music ever, and and there's no there's no guarantee that that was specifically recorded in 7.1. It was probably mixed out, but whatever. It's 7.1. Michael uh, wanted to confirm for Nick from last week that uh, Panasonic's Blu-ray players do have 5.1 FLAC off of USB drives, and he pointed out that the DMP BDT230 in particular. Uh, that it, it does a really good job, and it has a really nice low noise floor. So if you're really down with that, and you want to buy a new Blu-ray player, and don't want it to be an Oppo, there is a good suggestion for you. Al over on Facebook was uh, talking, asking us about isobaric subwoofers last week, uh, and there, we were wondering why anyone cares. Uh, <laughs> and apparently, he cares because back in the '90s, he uh, built one when he downsized mm -hmm. from two two four cubic foot subwoofers to just one. No, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> now we know. Now we know. And, and it was the 90s, so it totally makes sense. 
Yeah, back in the 90s, that was like, I think they were, yeah. <laughs> yeah, back in the 90s, that was a thing. And McKay's still there, apparently. Uh, David, over on Facebook, he sent us an article uh, from John Walkingson. And he is the author of The Art of Digital Audio. The, the article is entitled, We Need to Talk About Speakers, colon, Sorry, Audiophiles, Only IT Will Break the Sound Barrier. Uh, this article is very long and very dense. <laughs> uh, sort of meandering. <laughs> it's, it's not, you know... It, 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 it's not it, really, but yeah, it's... You know. It does feel that way when you read it. It feels like it meanders, but more it's more that it jumps. And I think... Mm. It, Sort of, it's almost uh, God. You know what it reminds me of is uh, that uh, stream of consciousness writing. Yes. That's what it kind of feels yeah. like. It's almost like you're inside his head, and he's like, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and this, and there, how there we are. And then you look at the beginning point and the end point. You're like, I have no idea how I got from one to the other. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he's talking. I read this last week, so it's not as fresh in my mind as it was mm -hmm. last week. Uh, but he's talking a lot about speaker design and uh, phase and uh, off-axis response and time alignment mm. and making sure that all sound is getting to you at the right time. Uh, it's, it's an interesting article. Uh, it's very long. It's like, it's like seven web pages long or five web pages. Five. Yeah, it's five yeah. web pages long, yeah. And they're not short ones. It's not like uh, it's not it's not what's the uh, it's not like um, not one of those slideshows. Yeah, not those slideshow on ones. But it's pretty it's time. pretty dense. So what did, what did you think about it? Uh, yeah, well, well, I mean, it, like most things that you know, there's some things that I agree with and some things that I I don't necessarily agree with with what he's saying. Um, you know, he's making generalizations for the sake of he's writing an article that's meant to get clicks, and of course he's going to say some things that he knows are controversial or overgeneralized just to try and stir up a little bit of you know ire in people or get them to respond or at least get them to read the article. So I think there's quite a bit of that going on. But you know, like the main thing he's talking about is first we need to understand the human auditory system and how it works. Works. And if we can understand how it works, then theoretically, shouldn't we be able to design a speaker that does everything just slightly better than the human auditory system, at which point it becomes, you know, quote unquote, perfect, at least to human ears. Now, I mean, the problem with that is there really is no such thing as a perfect speaker because a perfect speaker would just be a microphone in reverse, right? It would do exactly what the microphone does, but in reverse. But the problem with that is that microphones can end up being placed in all sorts of different places. The microphone could be placed right on the instrument. You know, we call that close miking or the, or the microphone on the completely opposite end of the spectrum could be put inside a pair of dummy ears and made a binaural recording. And the microphone is recording, you know, supposedly the same sound either way, but it's in completely different places. So you would need two completely different speakers to play that back. One would be way up at the front where the close mic was made. The other one would be inside your ears. And we have that, but you have to use the right one for the right type of recording. You know, so he mentions that, oh, one of the things that's happening with, you know, existing speakers is that they continue to be made the way that they're made because they're just covering up for the failings of recordings and the failings of data compression, which... I mean, I don't That's really agree with that. Because, I mean, <laughs> that means you have to. That means everybody has to universally agree on one place to put the microphones, right? And that's that's just that's not. That's not even desirable, in my opinion. Sometimes you want to get the sense that you're transported into the concert hall where the recording is being made, and other times you want to make it as make it seem as though the the instruments are being played right inside your room where you are right now, or you want to make a binaural recording because you're going to be listening to it on headphones. So on that side, I don't agree with that. Um, but I do agree with the whole idea of paying attention to what the human auditory system does, uh, because if we're not paying attention to that, then what are we doing? I, don't know I kind of felt that. like he was ignoring the room with all this too. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about the talking about, you know, so one of the, the one of the reasons why he says uh, only IT or information technology will break the sound ba barrier. He's talking about this idea of DSP yes. and uh, using DSP to uh, to correct for the speakers or the, uh, the, the 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 problems with the speakers, and that while true and something that we could do completely negates the fact that uh, or ignores the fact that once the speaker once the sound leaves the speaker it is now in your room okay where it gets it gets destroyed for completely different reasons and uh, I, I do agree that we can do a lot more and I like his assertion that 
we have to stop thinking about speakers in the way that we've been thinking about speakers, uh, and in that we have to stop uh, uh, worrying so much about uh, you know having a couple of drivers in a box and then ports and everything else. You know, let's get a little bit more high tech about it. And that's what one of the things I thought like when we talked last week, maybe the week before, about Kef and the Blade speakers is that that's what they kind of did. They said, hey, price is no object. What can we do? You know, and what will sound best? And that's what they came up with. Now, you know, is it the best? I don't know. But uh, I haven't heard every single speaker on the planet. But it is interesting. I, I think to me, it's more of a challenge for speaker designers, not something for us to think about. Because what we can what we can afford, generally, is not you know these are not questions that would uh, need to be answered for us because we can afford the stuff that's made that looks like every other speaker on the planet. Well, yeah, but for I a speaker mean, designer, you should be thinking to yourself: Do I still have to do it this way? Right. You know, is there a way to make a, a better speaker without just putting, you know, brilliant and everything? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think where his his argument really fell apart is, I mean, he keeps referring to legacy speakers, which, I mean, for all intents and purposes, he's referring to every speaker, speaker know ever. Because yeah, <laughs> you know, they're all pretty much the same. With the the there's a couple of exceptions out there, yeah, but they're all pretty I mean, much the same. He's sort of tacitly, if not, you know explicitly making the claim that they're really not advancing, that you know things have sort of stayed in a certain status quo and they're not advancing. And that that just patently isn't true at this point yeah. in time. I mean the thing is like like JBL, um, you know, they, they just had a, a great episode of uh, Home Theater Geeks where some guys from JBL Pro came on and this is exactly what they're doing. They're they're using DSP so that and they have a separate amplifier for each driver in the speaker, and they're using that digital signal processing to make sure that the power is always within, you know, the performance bandwidth of that particular driver, and making sure that you know it's pr it's producing not only frequency linear but also phase linear response coming out of that driver, and they can do that with the digital processing. So I mean, I don't know, it, does JBL not count as a legacy speaker company? I mean, they've been around for decades, right? Uh, Axiom is doing this with their new speakers; they have digital signal processing. Vizio is putting it in their sound bars, right? It's like lots of companies, lots of traditional speaker companies are doing exactly this. So his assertion that, you know, it's going to take some IT company like an Apple or a Microsoft or, you know, somebody else to come in and shake up the market. I just don't think that holds any water whatsoever. I no. think, it, you know, we have the proof right here that traditional loudspeaker companies are already doing this. Phase Technology did it, you know, years ago. So. Yeah. And, and you can actually look at like stuff like SVS with their subwoofers too and all the stuff they've been That's doing. Right. I mean, it's just a sub. It has one driver for the most part. You know, a couple of them have more than one. But that's one driver for the most part. And they're still putting a bunch of stuff in there to make sure that the driver doesn't clip, that there's no damage done to it, you know, and all that other stuff. Uh, that it's very, very linear. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's an interesting article. I think it's worth reading. Uh, I think you'll be confused through most of it. I... Being somebody who's been reading this for a really long time, even I occasionally had to go, oh, what was that? And I had to go back and reread it. Uh, so don't be Thank surprised. Uh, and even them. So, Eliezer, uh, he heard me say uh, that I'm very sensitive to hearing phase. Uh, when Eliezer was at a high-end audio store, he heard someone playing with the phase inversion switch on a Peachtree Audio Grand integrated X1 amplifier. He said that he heard a difference on some recordings. So what is this feature, and why is it only found on certain equipment? Well, let's start with the fact that you were listening to something, uh, or you were listening to a Peachtree. Peachtree is a high, high-end esoteric uh, company that uh, would certainly, one of the reasons why you find stuff on high-end esoteric gear is because they're looking for any reason why they can explain to you why it is that they cost 35 thousand dollars when you can get the <laughs> same thing for three hundred and fifty dollars uh, from another company. So let's start with that. So why is that why is this phase inversion switch on a Petri Audio Grand, whatever the heck it is? Uh, because why because it needs it, they just wanted to have something on there. Um, <laughs> I I looked at this, I couldn't quite figure out exactly why they thought they needed that on there. Uh, I guess, it, well. <laughs> Yeah. You know. there, there is a there is a, a sort of reason. Now now I just want to clarify, when you were saying that you're sensitive to hearing phase, I think you were talking about like having the speakers switched to the wrong like yeah, red going yeah, to black exactly. and black going to red. Um, yeah. when I never saw I was I was I was sensitive to phase like from a subwoofer. In fact I right. said like can't really hear that. So 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is a different thing. But I mean, you know, it has the word phase in it, so easy enough to be confused by it. What this is actually referring to is something called absolute phase, uh, which is basically a theory. Um, because in practice, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. So, absolute phase is the idea that. All right, let's say you're making a recording of a trumpet playing, or better yet, let's say you're making a recording of someone singing, all right? So the person singing is pushing air out of their mouth, you know, they're pushing air out of their lungs, and the sound is coming out of their mouth, and that should make, at least at the very beginning, the diaphragm of the microphone push inward, right? So the, the, there's pressure coming out of the person's mouth, so the microphone diaphragm pushed inward. And then the person draws in breath, and at least right at the beginning, the very, very beginning of that sound, that should bring the diaphragm of the microphone outward. It should suck it outward as the person sucks air into their lungs. So the whole idea of absolute phase is that, okay, that microphone diaphragm pushed in, that means we want the speaker diaphragm to also push in, at least at the very, very beginning of the sound, because obviously sound waves have to make at least one complete cycle to even exist. Um, <laughs> but at the very, very beginning, you know, if the microphone diaphragm pushed in, then the speaker diaphragm should also push in. And then if the microphone diaphragm gets sucked outward, then the speaker diaphragm should also get sucked outward. And that would be, you know, zero degrees absolute phase. But some people thought, wait a second, that's backwards. That's completely backwards because the microphone diaphragm was being pushed in because the singer was pushing air out, which means shouldn't the speaker diaphragm push out? Because the speaker diaphragm is mimicking the movement of the of the person making the sound, not of the microphone. So uh, this is the sort of thing that just makes me want to slap somebody. All right, things should be 180 degrees out of phase, yeah. absolute phase. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I that, so I, I go back to my original assertion, well, I can't figure out why anybody would need this, <laughs> and I stand by that wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, Rob, did you find this, or did Eliezer find this link? I found this link over at audiocheck.net, one of the yeah. sites I've mentioned many times for making sound test tones. They also have a blind test to see if you can detect absolute phase. <laughs> Let me tell you who can't detect absolute phase. He's got two thumbs, and it's uh -huh. this guy. Because I had, yeah. no, I, well, I was listening to those things and going, no, everything sounds the same. I didn't even bother. I got like two or three into it, went, screw this, and I was gone. That was it. I, I, I did all ten. I scored three out of ten. I did worse than a coin flip. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, just <laughs> think about it for a second, Elias, or anybody. Just think about it for a second. Do you, do, do you really think that this will make that much of a difference? Or any, really. It shouldn't make any difference. Now, the fact that he heard some differences is makes me think that whatever Petrie is doing is not exactly what it should be doing, right? Because they should be... Well, it's a little bit like flipping that 180 or zero degree polarity. So you, it's the room, then. On the subwoofer. It's the room, the positioning, and it would be in the base. If you're going to hear any difference, it's going to be in the base, and it's going to be because you literally flipped the polarity of the base just like you would on a subwoofer, and that's going to depend on the positioning. So I can see there being the possibility of hearing a difference. Mm. Oh, with headphones, I couldn't. So No, with headphones, uh, not, I absolutely could not. not. I could not, so there you go. So, okay. Number anyway, two, he, is. <laughs> he, uh, he knows we've talked ad nauseum about the whole some speakers are for music and some speakers are for movies topic. But Andrew Jones, the man himself, was recently on HT Geeks, and he made that distinction uh, twice during that podcast. Uh, it's something that keeps being repeated by influential people, so how do we feel when somebody, someone respects brings it up? Um, I think that's patronizing. I do. I think it's patronizing. I think when we say a speaker is good for music, it, it's a compliment. We say when it's good for mu movies, it's an insult. Therefore, uh, the only reason to make the distinction is to use the word good for a speaker that we don't like. Okay? Mm. Uh, very rarely have I used that distinction in a positive manner. Uh, subwoofers, this is a great sub for movies, uh, means that it hits low. Or it could mean that it's flabby and you should only use it for explosions. Uh, so it could go either way with that one. But I could see it being used in a positive way for uh, movies, uh, for a subwoofer. But generally speaking, um, you know, it's just one of these things that you wonder 
whether or not they're saying it because they think that people that they actually believe that and think that there is a distinction between movies and because I've never met a professional that actually thought yes I designed this speaker for movies not for music because no movies have music in them right <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've never met a speaker designer who who's, was designing only for music. You know, uh, it's just not done. Uh, second, uh, I think what they're really doing is that they think that people are expecting that to be said, and therefore it's in the public consciousness. And therefore, they're, it's like that whole ten percent thing. That new movie, what's her, what's it, what's it called, oh, Lucy? Lucy? Yeah, yeah ten percent. Only use ten percent of the of the brain. Well, I think in the mo in the movie, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, but they don't say 10% of our brains. They say 10% of our brain's potential, which is, I guess, less wrong than saying 10% of our brains. But it's still, <laughs> it's still, well, and I, I, I saw a review, and basically what they're doing is they're using this. And it's, you know, it, it's movie logic. There's all sorts of movie logic that we sort of mm -hmm. forgive, like explosion in space, because explosions that we hear in space are awesome. And therefore we're all like, oh, I know it's not really, you can't really hear it, but maybe it's so awesome that you can because now my subwoofer is doing something. <laughs> uh, you know, so we sort of forgive these things, but I think they're using it as sort of a like a uh, an experience point thing. You know, like oh, she's got thirty experience points. You know, now she gets her new power. You know, sort of thing. So oh, yeah. that, that's I just I, I kind of forgive it, but I think people are expecting that they, they think people are expecting that him or uh, them to say things like "good for movies, good for music." You know, there's good and there's bad. That's all there is to it. Uh, a bad speaker is is less noticeably bad when it's only playing you know, a, a smaller range of frequencies, which is what happens most of the time during movies. You got vocals, you got the occasional explosion, and then there's music every once in a while. Whereas music, it's there's a lot more information there over a greater greater range of the frequency response, and therefore you're going to hear more things wrong with it more quickly. Therefore, a good a speaker that's not very good is going to sound distinctly not as good with music, uh, but it's still just a bad speaker. Yeah, I mean the thing is, I, I, I think I know where people are generally coming from, especially someone like Andrew Jones, um, where they're coming from with this. Because I mean, I, I have the perfect example, which is this Vizio soundbar that I got from my parents. Now, I can s it has a lot of adjustments on it, and one of them is DTS True Surround, formerly known as SRS True, uh, True Surround, and uh, DTS True Volume. And what DTS True Volume does is it makes sure that, you know, explosions aren't any louder than dialogue. It'll boost up dialogue and quiet down explosions. But it's also uh, designed so that it, it's one of these digital signal processing things that we were just talking about. It makes sure that the drivers themselves don't distort. You know, it'll actually apply filters because they've measured the particular drivers that are built into that particular soundbar, and they say, all right, if we play this particular frequency too loud, you'll start getting distortion or clipping just inside of the driver itself, and we can avoid that with filters, and that's all built into the true volume setting. Well, if you turn on true volume and you listen to music, it all sounds a little bit weird, because there are these filters being applied, and, you know, there's no dynamics, not that there's a lot of dynamics in a lot of music anyway, but, you know, all of these things are being done to the signal, and music sounds strange. But the thing that it does well is it makes dialogue easy to hear and understand. And for someone like my parents who are a little bit older and have a, bit of, a little bit of hearing loss just from age, that's what they care about by far the most when they're watching TV and movies. They just want to be able to hear and understand what people are saying. And if other things in the background sound a little bit off as a result of that, they don't care. So for them, you know, I will say true volume on the Vizio soundbar is good for movies and bad for music because the most important thing is to be able to understand what the actors are saying. And, you know, taking it from that viewpoint, I can agree. But the point is, is that if it sounds weird for music, then it isn't playing movies accurately. Do we want the dialogue to be more intelligible? Yes, we do. So I can I can understand the distinction in that kind of sense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I can see it too. I yeah. can see it too. But uh, yeah, that, that's such a very specific case, though. You know, and I, I, I don't know. All right, I don't want to step into which I'm on it, but yes, I think it's patronizing. I think it's insulting. I think it's it's wrong. I think they know it's wrong. Uh, but uh, for, when they're talking about speakers in general. You know, yes. So if sets. someone says these speakers are really good for movies, what they probably mean is I could understand what the actors were saying. Not. That's probably what they mean. 
I yeah, I think that most of the time what they're saying is these are kind of crappy, but if you want to buy them and not feel bad about yourself, then you know, uh, this yes. is the, this is the bone uh, this bone I will throw you. Uh, LSR also made a list of not too expensive DAX. These are digital to analog converters, uh, and we're going to post these on Facebook. Have we done this already? We have not, right? We haven't posted these already. Uh, no, I have not posted this particular list, although some of them are duplicates of one we already threw up there. Yeah. Uh, he's tried and recommends all of them, saying that any differences are really, really subtle, which is because DAC, DAC, IA DAC is a very mature technology, and uh, anybody who says differently is just trying to feel superior, feel, justify their own purchase uh, or make you feel justified in your purchase. And not really worth it unless you have a bad source like a laptop. Okay, so basically what what Elias says is that if you got a bad source, a DAC will help you out. If you don't have a bad source, eh, skip it. But he's got a good list here. So I guess the top is the top half of this is the this the non-portable stuff. That's right. Uh, when when we we'll talk, we'll, I, I, are we going to go through these or we're we just going to? No, list let, let's them just on? throw the list up on Facebook and I'll put it in the show notes at avrant.com. They range from three hundred dollars down to. A, a hundred. Yep. I have never heard of that that one. That sh sh I can't say. Can I not it, say that on the podcast? Well, it looks like it isn't a swear word. It sounds like a swear word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that company did that on purpose because they wanted free press or whatever. It's yeah. So okay. Funny. So now I won't talk about them. So, mm -hmm. but yes, they go. Most of them are around uh, two hundred bucks. Generally speak, one hundred ninety to. to yeah, but two hundred dollars. A couple of them are three hundred dollars. So, if you're looking for uh, a portable or non-portable DAC, these are all good options. I like, uh, I like all of them. There you go. Whatever. Travis, uh, he has some Golden Ear Aeon three uh, bookshelf speakers. A, a REL. Is it REL or R E L? Do you have to say it? I don't know. I always say REL. It is capitalized, though. I have no idea. I know. I, I would go with R E L, but shoe is shoe or whatever. She she or whatever it is. Uh, or, uh, a REL T2 subwoofer and a Pioneer Elite VSX 45TX AV receiver. And it's all being fed from an optical output from his computer. Uh, he's. Uh, okay. We'll just skip that part. Uh, he has never run the MCACC auto setup. In fact, he's lost the setup uh, microphone. Okay. The first question is this. Do we think it would be worth tracking down via eBay or however uh, a uh, microphone to use the MCACC auto setup? Um, no. Do we have to expand on that? <laughs> I think we should expand uh, on that. I mean... To, if you find one for five bucks and you're really curious, I mean, what the heck? Um, uh, Literally, it has to be money you're willing to throw away. Like money, yeah. you will absolutely not miss. That's the that's the only way I would say it would be okay. I've run the MCACC. I've used it before. In fact, I want to say I used it on a receiver that was very close to this one. In fact, if you start talking for a second, I'll look up which review which receiver I used. Sure. Yeah. The thing is, the, the particular model of Pioneer receiver that he has is a little bit older, and it's using one of the older versions of MCACC. They, they've since made improvements and uh, got more advanced versions of it. So the thing is, I'm thinking Travis at some point will probably be replacing. That that AV receiver. I mean, maybe not. Maybe he'll hold on to it for a really long time. But if he is going to replace it even within the, like, the next two or three years, I'm like, I wouldn't worry about it. I, I would just wait until you have a new one, and whatever new one you get will have some sort of auto setup and come with a microphone. So uh, yeah. yeah, I the, I did the VSX 516, mm -hmm. so it's probably not as nice as the one that he's got. Uh, but uh, I did review that, and I did run the MCACC on that. I was not impressed. Uh, the older versions of MCACC, I mean, until very recently, they did not apply any EQ whatsoever to the base, which yeah. is where you need EQ the most. So given that, I'm just, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a tremendous value to be going chasing after. All right, the REL T2 subwoofer, he has that connected uh, via the high-level speaker on connector. Okay, this is a proprietary, I guess, connector from REL. Okay. Well, yeah, the speak on connector uh, exists for other things, but does it know, really? See it. Oh yeah, it's mostly in pro audio. I've never for. seen it, so yeah, it's got to be all pro yeah. audio stuff. So, anyways, what it looks like is there's like three spade connectors, which go to like an XLR almost, right? 
Yeah, it's kind of similar looking ish to an XLR yeah. connector. Yeah. Yeah, and the XLR ish thingy goes into the subwoofer, and the other thing goes onto your speaker, your speaker wires, like where you're, where you connect from to, from your receiver to your receiver. I mean, from your receiver to your speakers, right? To, right there at that same connection. Yeah, the, the binding posts, the actual yeah. speaker and post goes right on there. So his question is, should he continue to use this, or should he run a regular coax subwoofer cable to the R the L to LFE input on his uh, REL? Uh, or a RHEL T2 subwoofer. Uh, honestly, dude, that is the most bizarre connection I have ever seen, and it requires that you're sending a full range signal to your speakers, to your main speakers. Yes, it does. Yep. In order for there to be the bass. So if you have a crossover engaged, you're just not even sending any bass to, this, to the thing. I can't imagine a situation where I would run, I would use that in place of a coax subwoofer connection ever if it's available. The only time I would ever use this is if there was literally no other way to connect the subwoofer to yeah, well, I mean, there the receiver. Were some, you know, some, some, I mean, still a lot of the... Uh, integrated stereo, amplifiers. Yeah, the stereo amplifiers. Stereo, yeah. They have no subwoofer output, so if you want to connect one, you have to connect it to the speaker wire connections, and this at least gives you a way to do that. I mean, a lot of subwoofers, there's no way to connect them to the, to the speaker wire, so at least this gives you that. But no, if you have an AV receiver that can do proper bass management, and this Pioneer receiver can, I would absolutely nix that speak on connection, and I would use a regular would... RC a burn it with fire. I would just, I just, just <laughs> run away from that thing. I just, I know it looks fancy, but it's not doing you any favors. So it certainly yeah. isn't. It's requiring that you send a full range signal for to your to your main speakers. There, you cannot run your crossover. Yeah. That and, and that means that now you're running full range to your speakers, which I, I, I don't. Uh, maybe he already is doing that, but we never recommend that. Uh, you can try it and see how it sounds, but in this case. Uh, I would probably cross them over. I, I'm not; those are bookshelf speakers. So if you're yeah, running full range of those speakers. bookshelves, you know, it, it, the best case scenario is that they're not bothering me out and making weird noises as they're trying to play far lower than they were designed. Best case, you know, worst case is that they are doing those things and you're damaging your speaker. So you should be running your speaker, your crossover, in a uh, you know 80 hertz or whatever. I don't know the the specs of these things, but you should do the the things that we've talked about where you you run your bass sweeps, you listen for the distortion or where it, where it starts to cut out, and then that's where you run your crossover a little bit above that, and then you use the subwoofer output to your sub, and then call us back and let us know how much better it sounds because I'm pretty sure that's what you're going to experience. Uh, yep. Carlos, this is literally, are we literally now only to this week? We are indeed. We have oh. made it to this week. Only about an hour and ten minutes on. That's not too bad, I guess. <laughs> Carlos. Carlos has a front projector uh, ceiling mounted in the f on the first floor of his house. Directly above it is the second floor. Uh, it, it, oh, I'm sorry. Directly above it on the second floor is a hallway. Whenever someone walks through that hallway, his projector vibrates and the image bounces on the screen. <laughs> yup. <laughs> we can all picture and imagine this. What can we do to eliminate? What can you do to eliminate this problem? Well, like I said uh, before the podcast really started, you could just put everybody in the room until the movie. So, Daddy's watching the movie. <laughs> you get, you're not allowed out for the next two and a half. <laughs> and it's the extended version of Lord of the Rings. So, uh, we'll see you in three and a half hours. Uh, I don't know if that's a viable solution. Uh, now, there are oodles and oodles of mounts out there. Uh, I don't think any of them will adequately address this problem. I think that the problem, if it's shaking that much, the problem is that you need to figure out some way to keep your roof, the ceiling in this room from vibrating, which seems like it's not going to be the case. Now, if it were me, I know Rob's going to have a different suggestion. If it were me, I would. my first question to you would be, how close is that projector to a wall? Uh, because if the walls not, if the ceiling's vibrating, that's a problem. But if it's close to a wall where you can put a, an extended shelf, you know, and you know, attach that shelf to the wall, then you may have just solved your problem. Yes, it's not going to look as nice as a thing hanging down the middle, you know, hanging down your ceiling, but it won't be vibrating anymore. So there's that. Um, 
you know, a, a, some sort of reinforcement on the, you know, uh, a, on the ceiling uh, up there. Uh, you'd have to talk to somebody, like a contractor or something, about that. Uh, you could possibly try to put like a like a, a two like a, a big a big piece of uh, of uh, or maybe a couple two by fours or whatever, you know, across your beams and secure it to multiple beams and then secure the mount to that. All of this sounds absolutely horrible. I'm sure he's like twitching, thinking about uh, how bad this is going to look. Uh, but if it were me, I would try to. The, you know, my first my first solution would be to try to get it off the ceiling. Actually, my first solution would be to look into all the most expensive mounts in the world and see if any of them will fix this. And if not, then realize <laughs> we have to go pretty extreme. I would look at a wall and then look at trying to reinforce where the mount is attached. So that it's uh, it's not doing this anymore. It sounds like it kind of sounds like he's attached right to the you know to the drywall almost like he, you know that and that's why it's vibrating because those you know those cross members should not be vibrating like that. Okay. And if that's the case, you know maybe the solution is to to get a more secure connection. That means putting up some sort of reinforcement and connecting connecting directly to that, and that and then maybe painting it all so that it hopefully isn't as noticeable in your room. I don't know, dude. I think you're you're gonna have to talk to a professional. But what do yeah, you think, Rob? I, th I think Carlos was hoping we could just point to some sort of you know shock mount or something like that. I mean, we have shock mounts from microphones and things like that. They do not they exist still vibrate, for projectors. Though. Yeah, they do not <laughs> exist for projectors because you the last thing you want is for your projector to be mobile and able to swing or tilt or bounce or move because it, it, it just doesn't really work when it's hanging down from a ceiling. And, you know, the, the last thing you want to do is put it as some sort of an extension tube onto your um, projector mount. Some people have suggested that as though giving it greater distance will work. No, that would just create a lever, which would amplify any movement if you <laughs> sort of an extension tube. So everybody's going to get uh, everybody's going to get to seasick while watching your movie as it's swinging yeah, back and forth. That is not a solution. So here's the thing. First of all, when you walk across your floors, like a hallway, and it doesn't sound like people are doing calisthenics on it, they're just walking down the hallway, your floors should not be bouncing. That is not a very good thing. It means that the construction of your house, I'm sorry to say, is uh, not, not, not too so it's great. suspect. Um, at this point, very, somebody it, cut something they weren't supposed to when they added on. Yeah, it's very possible that the uh, the floor joists that are holding up your second floor are uh, maybe, you know, I think minimum code is 2 by 8 so they should be more like 2 by 12s um, You know, 2 by 10s are okay. Maybe they're spaced 24 inches on center instead of 16 or 12 inches on center, which would be great. Um, I mean, the, the real way to solve this problem is to beef up the construction of your house so that your floors aren't bouncing anymore. But that's probably a little bit more work and expense than what Carlos was hoping to hear. Here's the thing. This is a kind of similar to soundproofing. In soundproofing, what we're always trying to do is reduce the vibrations as close to the source of the vibration as possible. In other words, if you're worried about sounds outside of your theater leaking into your theater, then you want to put as much of your soundproofing techniques on the outside of your theater, the side that's making the noise, the side that you want to damp and get rid of. So in a case like this where we're talking about physical vibrations, people walking, the more you can do to the floor upstairs versus the ceiling in your theater that's downstairs, that's the way to go. So, I mean, this can be as simple as get a really nice thick carpet pad and some, some thick carpet and put that in your hallway just to damp the vibrations. Beef up that floor, you know, lay down another layer of three-quarter inch plywood, tongue and groove, glue it down on top of your floor, try and strengthen up that floor, and then put down a carpet pad or something. I mean, that's the way to come at this. You need to try and damp the vibrations where they're beginning. That's the best way to solve this problem. I'm sorry, I can't say something that's cheaper and easier than that. That's yeah, kind of what you have to do. I really think that if his ceiling is vibrating, I'm hoping with the problem is that it's not really securely attached to one of the joists, okay, one of the yeah. cross members. And if that's the case, well, then securely attach it to one of the cross members and see if that helps. Uh, that would, at the very least, that means that your floor, that the with a ceiling is not, you know. Sag, gonna sag and fall in at some point, but if if this continues to be a problem, I really would recommend that you talk to somebody, a professional, about it because we're not construction guys, obviously. So, and I, I would that would worry me 
uh, if that was going on. Uh, like my parents are <laughs> like my parents are living with me right now. Obviously, I've talked about that a lot, and they're renovating a house. Where they tore open the ceiling to go do something, and they looked up and went, "Oh, that's not supposed to be like that." Somebody, in order to do something, had cut through, uh -huh. you know, a bunch of cross, you know, the, the, oh, a bunch of the cross beams and that stuff. And they're all like, "All the time." It all happens time constantly. Happens. So they had to they had to spend like three grand to get, and this is just for the actual beam, a beam to be put in there mm -hmm. to reinforce the ceiling. And once they put this beam in there, and it, it looks, you know, it's a shame we have to cover the thing up because it looks amazing. Once they put that beam in there, reattached everything, the guy looked at them and went, you can now build the second floor in this house if you want. And they're like, we don't <laughs> want to. He goes, but you could. And that's what it takes. It takes yeah. you know, the proper construction. So, Carlos, you might want to look into that. Uh, yeah, and... about the only other possible thing, and this, this, this won't totally solve your problem. It might help a little bit. Uh, about the only thing you could do is instead of using a projector ceiling mount, the type that you just connect the ceiling mount onto the ceiling and then hang your projector upside down onto the mount, you could construct something that's more like a shelf that hangs down from your ceiling and then use like some sort of thick compliant little rubber feet. Uh, there are like those ISO nodes. Uh, I can put a link to those. They're ridiculously overpriced, but um, some sort of compliant rubber feet that can sort of act as shock absorbers and put that under your projector. I mean, this is a little bit like the idea of a shock mount. Once it starts moving, it's going to vibrate for a little while. So it might actually make things worse, but the vibration shouldn't be as severe. So it should be smaller yes. vibrations that last longer. Uh, I don't know if that is something. You wow, that's that so you're be, selling but, that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna come up with something that's less expensive, yeah. and that's about all I, I can it's, think. I don't think there is less expensive. Uh, less expensive is just if it if it's only mounted to the drywall, and then it's yeah, then it just needs to be moved slightly. Uh, yeah. That's less expensive. Connected to a joist, yeah. Yeah, Ashley over at Twitter uh, has an. Asus Zone. In fact, I should let you read this one because I don't even know if I can read this one. Asus Zonar HDAV 1.3 Slim Audio Sound Card in his PC that he's using to feed his Logitech Z5500 5.1 speaker setup. These are these the little ones? Yeah, they're computer speakers. This is computer speakers, right? The little ones with like it usually has a. a, a are they? They have a little base module, and the base module feeds everything else. Is that yeah, one of those? It's got a. Uh, it's got a control thing that has the volume dial that sits on your desk, and the, uh -huh. out, the output from your sound card goes into that control panel. Yeah. And then the control panel has uh, one cable that goes out to a little subwoofer. Yeah. And the subwoofer has its own amplifier and the amplifiers for all five, five speakers built into its enclosure, and then it feeds the five speakers with regular speaker wire and spring clips. Yeah. So okay. All right. Uh, he's using several different players. Oh wait, okay. First of all, he'd like to know what ASO, A S I O, is and what his optimal setting should be. <laughs> yes, yes. Who doesn't know this? Okay, so um, first of all, this ASUS Zonar card. Uh, the the reason for its existence was in the days of Windows Vista, uh, and anyone who wanted to build a home theater PC in the Windows Vista days faced something very vexing, which was that when you went to play a Blu-ray or at the time HD DVD, both of which had lovely lossless HD audio in the form of Dolby True HD or DTS HD Master Audio, well, you'd think to yourself, hey, if I get myself a video card that has an HDMI output, I should be good to go, right? Well, not in the days of Windows Vista, because Windows Vista, for whatever reason, did not support in any way, shape, or form the copy protection that is on the audio. So even when you're sending out a True HD or a DTS HD bitstream audio via HDMI, there's still copy protection on that audio itself, a separate copy protection from the video. So Windows Vista supported the copy protection on the video side. It did not support the copy protection on the audio side. So people would connect up their HDMI video cards and they would get picture, but no sound. So Asus developed this card and it's the silliest thing because you can take the, out, the HDMI output of your video card, plug it into via an HDMI to HDMI cable, there's an HDMI in on the Asus Zonar card. You can plug it into the Asus Zonar. The Asus Zonar will add the requisite copy protection to the audio signal and then send it out again as HDMI. And now you have the requisite copy protection 
layered on top of the thing that was coming out of the PC in the first place. That is the reason for this card's existence. Now, Ashley is not making use of any of that whatsoever. First of all, he's not using Windows Vista. And second of all, he's using the optical digital output, which doesn't handle HD audio in any way. It can handle two-channel PCM, or it can handle regular vanilla Dolby Digital or regular DTS. So that's the connection he's using. Now, ASIO is a driver that stands for, oh, what the heck did that thing stand for? Audio Stream Input Output, that is the ASIO. It is actually a licensed uh, driver that came from a, Germany comp a German company called Steinberg. Uh, so whatever company is using it has to license it from that company. And the whole idea of ASIO was that. Inside of Windows, normally if you go to your control panel and you go to sound or you right click on the little speaker volume icon in your system tray and go to your playback devices, all of that stuff is being handled by Windows. That's called the Windows Mixer. And that means that any sounds that are going on in your system, Windows is getting a hold of it. It's almost always resampling it. It's mixing in things like little dings and uh, alert sounds and button clicks and all that kind of stuff. And then it's resampling it all and sending it all back out. And normally Windows does this at a maximum of a 16-bit bit depth. It, it won't handle 24-bit audio. Uh, you can set it to output 24-bit audio, but usually what it's doing is downsampling everything to 16 and then upsampling it again and sending it out. So naturally, people wanted to avoid Windows getting in the way of their audio if they're wanting to use high-resolution audio. So this ASIO driver is one way of doing that. It bypasses all the Windows stuff and lets you use whatever settings are bundled in with the Asus card instead, and the signal goes directly from your playback software to the sound card with the ASIO drivers handling it instead of the Windows mixer. So that's what it's doing. As for the optimal settings, that is all inside of Asus's own software. And unfortunately, their software is not perfect either. It will let you pass through the 24-bit stuff, unlike just the regular Windows audio. But, I mean, there's a lot of fiddling with the settings. Mostly what you want to do is turn off every kind of enhancement that you can find. And you want to just set it to output... Uh, in this case, you, uh, there's an optical output setting or an SPDIF setting. That's the Sony Philips digital interface setting. You just want to set that to PCM. Even though it says PCM, if you're playing regular Dolby Digital or regular DTS, it will pass out those bit streams as the player instructs it to. So the setting you want is PCM. After that, just turn off all enhancements, and those are your optimal settings. You're doing the least amount of processing to your audio that you can, and that's what you want to do. So that's that part. All right, he's using several, several different players, Plex, VCL, Power DVD, iTunes, and with some of them, his computer defaults to outputting the audio via the onboard analog connections rather than through the ACES Sonar sound card's optical connection. Any tips as to make how to stop this from happening? Yeah, in this case, uh, you do actually want to use that control panel sound or the right-click on the volume icon in your system tray. Go to your playback devices and right-click on every single device that is not your Zonar optical output. So you'll see some sort of regular stereo output that's part of Windows. Usually that'll be a real tech driver, which are universally pretty awful, but that's usually what's built in there. Uh, you might see the HDMI audio output listed, all of those things. You want to right-click on everything that is not the optical output in this case and disable it. And that way, the only thing that is enabled, then the only thing that is functioning is your Asus Sonar card. Now, regardless of what player you're using, you don't have to adjust the individual player settings, even if they say, hey, use the Windows default. Well, guess what? The only thing that exists now is the optical output on your Sonar. So that's one way to always make sure that even if you don't want to fiddle with the individual settings of each and every player, it will use the output that you want to use, because it's the only choice left. Yes. Okay, and last but not least, his uh, Z5500 speakers mentioned handling up to 96 kilohertz 24-bit audio, but nothing higher, so should you take that into account when adjusting the settings for his audio uh, output from his PC? Now, I saw this question, or this part, this was over Twitter, wasn't it? Yeah, I saw this part. Twitter, yeah, because yeah, he was thinking about setting out a higher uh, stream, so 192, 24, 32-bit. Uh, something like that, and should he take that? Should he do that? No, it's not going to do you any good. So, you know, it might even mess things up uh, if it can't handle it at all. But it usually will just just put out 96, uh, 24. So yeah, you don't want to go any higher than 96, 24. Yeah, you can you can set that in the uh, output settings of the uh, Asus software. And I'll just mention one other thing because uh, on more modern software, like for example, J River is really popular as a high uh, high resolution audio player. Uh, a lot of people like that, and some other players have this too. I 
don't actually think any of the players he's using have this option Plex might. But there's another thing called... I mean, I just call it Wasapi because that's the way it looks, but it's actually the Windows Audio Session Application Programming Interface, W-A-S-A-P-I. What that allows uh, to happen is that the software now, whatever your software player is, that's JRiver, Plex, uh, whatever it is that you're using, it can define how it sends the audio instructions directly to your hardware. It bypasses Windows. It also bypasses the Asus ASIO drivers. It bypasses everything. And the software now sends the instructions directly to the hardware with nothing in between. And so most people are finding that's what they want to use because that way any audio changes they want to make, they can make in the player software and they don't have to worry about any other piece of software getting in the way and messing up the signal somehow. It's just a direct pipe from the software to the hardware. So if you have the option of choosing WASAPI, then that's usually a good choice. And people wonder why no, more people don't have HD PCs. This is yeah, why. It's With just a slightly pain complicated. In the butt. <laughs> Jason wants to know how to calculate required amplifier power. He, uh, he wants to know if there was an easy to use online calculator to figure out how much amplifier power is needed for a given speaker at a given distance. He forgot to say at a bit given volume, but that's, I guess, understood. Uh, something again to the online viewing distance calculator for screen sizes. He found one from Harmon, but he'd like to know how accurate this. He's also interested in just knowing how he could figure it out for himself. Oh, I don't know. I used to know the math. Uh, I just never <laughs> very good. I was never very good at it. I looked it up one time. I tried to explain it on the podcast. It went horrible. So uh, I know I know Rob can do it, but. Um, yeah, you can do it in a series of steps. So we, we will definitely link to this um, calculator that he found because it is useful. Now, the one thing is um, it's essentially meant for an outdoor venue. Like they're talking about distances of 100 meters, you know, and trying to hit like 120 decibels and that, thus requiring things like three or 4,000 watts of power. So they're talking about a professional setting in like an outdoor concert venue. And when you're outdoors and you don't have walls and ceiling and floors relatively close to you, every time you double your distance away from the speaker, you lose about six decibels of output. That's when your outdoors are in a really huge room. But when you're in a small room, and I mean anything that would be in a regular home that any of us might be living in, even a great room that's, you know, your living room, kitchen and dining room all combined, any of those are still considered a small room. I mean, compare that to an outdoor amphitheater, right? It's small compared to that regardless. Once you have those walls, ceiling and floor relatively close to you, now every time you double your distance away from the speaker, you really only lose about three decibels because there's all the sound reflecting around. Even if you've acoustically treated your room, even if you have plush furniture and a thick carpet, all that, you're still getting enough reflected energy within your room that you really only lose about three decibels for every doubling of distance. So if you use the calculator that's on Harman's website, it's actually part of their Crown Audio, that's their professional audio amplifier side, it's going to give you, once you plug in all your values and hit calculate, it's going to give you a larger number of watts than what you really need in a house. Because it's assuming that, let's say you plug in a value of four meters, you know, approximately 12 feet, it's assuming you've then lost 12 decibels of output but in reality, you've probably lost closer to six. So you can sort of fudge that by just saying, all right, if I'm sitting 12 feet away, I know in my, a regular room, I've lost about six decibels. Therefore, when I'm using this, uh, um, this calculator from Harman, I can plug in a two meter difference instead of a four meter uh, distance. Yes, um, that, that'll, that'll compensate for that. So he was wondering if this thing is accurate. It is accurate, as long as you know about that whole thing about how much it's subtracting for distance. And you have to be aware, it asks you to plug in the loudspeaker's sensitivity rating. And it, it says right on here, they're expecting that to be uh, listed as one watt, one meter, which is very common. You'll see a lot of speakers, the sensitivity will be listed as something like 86 decibels, one watt, one meter. And that's great. If that's what you've got, go ahead and plug that value in. But unfortunately, you'll also see a lot of speakers that are rated at 2.83 volts, one meter, not one watt, one meter. If they're listed at 2.83 volts, now you have to look at the impedance of the speaker. Most speakers are an 8 ohm nominal impedance, but some of them are a 4 ohm nominal impedance, or some of them are a 6 ohm, or some other value. Usually it's 4, 6, or 8. If it's an 8 ohm nominal impedance speaker, and it's listed as 2.83 volts, 1 meter, that is the same as 1 watt, 1 meter. So 
if it's eight ohms, just go ahead and plug in the exact same decibel level that they gave you. But if it's a four ohm speaker, and it's 2.83 volts one meter instead of one watt one meter, if it's a four ohm speaker, it's actually two watts which might be the reason that they listed it as 2.83 volts instead of one watt because it gives a larger number for the decibels. So what that's actually saying is that, let's say it says 86 decibels, 2.83 volts, one meter, but it's a four ohm speaker. What that's really saying is eight, uh, 86 decibels, two watts, one meter, or 83 decibels, one watt, one meter. Because every time you double the number of watts, one to two in this case, double the number, that is a three decibel difference. That's part of the math that you can remember if you want to work this out for yourself. Every time you double the number of watts, so this would be the same as going from 100 to 200 watts, if you double the number of watts, it only adds three decibels of output. The tricky one is if you have a six ohm rated speaker, then it's actually 1.33 watts per meter. So that ends up being kind of a weird number to throw in there. But if you you can plug all these into the calculator. We'll link up to it. If you want to figure it out for yourself, the way to do it is you take that sensitivity rating. So we just talked about that, and we know that that's one watt, one meter, or two watts, one meter, or 1.33 watts, one meter. It's that one meter distance. Now you figure out how far away are you sitting. And it's easiest if you just work in you know, doubling the distance each time. So if you're six feet away, you're now two meters approximately, and approximate is fine. We're just trying to get rough ballpark figures here. If you're 12 feet away, that's four meters. You've doubled twice. Every time you double the distance away, we're in a regular house, we're gonna subtract about three decibels from that figure. So again, starting at 86 decibels, let's say you're 12 feet away, you lost six decibels. So now if you plug in one watt to this 86, decibel, one watt, one meter speaker, now you're down to 80 watts. If you, if you uh, have one watt being drawn into this speaker, it's producing 80 decibels when you're 12 feet away. So the math of how many watts does it take to get you back up to whatever value you want, if you want to increase the output by 10 decibels, multiply the watts by 10. So if you want to get to 90 decibels in this example, you multiply one by 10. It takes 10 watts with this particular speaker from 12 feet away to produce 90 decibels of output. If you want to add three decibels, you double those watts. So going from 10 watts to 20 watts will get you 93 decibels in this case. And so you can sort of work that out. What we're mostly worried about is hitting 85 decibels uh, is sustained, because that is full reference volume, and 105 decibel peaks, because that is the the highest, loudest that reference volume should ever be playing in your room. So if you just remember, every time you want to add 10, multiply whatever you're at by 10. If you want to uh, add 3, uh, multiply it by 2. And you can get you know, pretty close to whatever figure you want to hit uh, just using that. And it will all work out. So, so if you're sitting 6 meters away, that's 12. Well, no, that's six uh, meters. Six meters away would be a little tricky. It'd be easier if you were eight. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going by. Yeah. So, so I'm halving it because of this. So, so say you're sitting four meters away. So I'll put two in here. Eighty-five yep. decibels at your listening position. Mm -hmm. Eighty-six. Uh, uh, eighty-six uh, sensitivity. Like six watts. And if you want, how would you say for peaks? One hundred and seven. Uh, well, what you can do is, uh, in the calculator, it allows you to put amplifier headroom. Mm -hmm. So you can put 20 in there, because we're trying to hit the desired listening level is 85, and then we want 20 decibels of headroom so we can hit 105. Yeah, and that okay. will, you plug that in there, and it will show you, and it should be 20, or what is it, uh, 100 times as much. Yeah. It should be 300 watts. 318, according to this. Yeah, well, because it's doing meters, not feet, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's pretty darn close. But that's only that's that's pretty much instantaneous at that point. So really, to get the 85 with just mm -hmm. a normal amount of headroom, like 3 dB of headroom, you need mm -hmm. six. Yeah. <laughs> and if, if, you're, if you're just worried about hitting 85 dB, you can put in the calculator zero dB of headroom because yeah. that'll tell you exactly how many watts you need to hit 85 dB. So if you have you know, in, in this case, we're saying you've got a speaker that's a, a regular sensitivity, 86 decibels, one watt, one meter. You're sitting in your room probably about 12 feet away from it. Uh, we're accounting for that in this calculator from Harmon and saying we're only two meters away so that it's six decibels quieter. It only takes three watts. It takes you three whole watts. Yep, yep. So Ooh. thank God you have those 300 
you know, those 500 watt mono blocks that you bought that, are, that you had to have a forklift bring them in, because <laughs> yes, uh, Mike, God, he's got the same speakers. He has the same Logitech speakers. Oh my God, what is this? Is that con contagious? Okay, Mike has got the same speakers as Ashley Logitech Z5500s. Uh, uh, he like to incorporate a plate amplifier that can. Oh, Jesus. All right. <laughs> what he wants? What is he? The, the plate amplifier seems to be connected to a tactile transducer. That's just one of those things yeah. that you attach you attach to your couch to shake your couch. I'm not mm -hmm. a fan of these things, but Mike's got one. He wants to use it. Uh, he would like to incorporate a plat, uh, plate amplifier that can only accept a low-level RCA connection. Uh, he would like to know how to connect this uh, separate amplifier to his Logitech system. He's currently using an optical toslink cable from his computer to the, uh, the Z5500, which is just like uh, Ashley was. That control center then connects to the Z5500 subwoofer using a D-sub connection. The subwoofer powers itself and has five speaker wire spring clip type connections that power the five satellite speakers. He's been taking the left front speaker wire output from the 5500 subwoofer, running that through a high level to low level converter and sending the resulting output to separate plate to the to the separate plate amplifier. Is he doing this correctly? Nothing about this is correct, Mike. There's not a thing about this that I agree with on any single level. Think about the the uh, the absurdity of the whole thing. You tried to connect a, a tactile in, uh, transducer to computer speakers. Okay, that being said, we're gonna help. All right, but that, that's that also not that being rare. Said, they have those little mini butt kickers. They have one that's specifically designed to attach to a computer chair, like one that has a you know uh, the little stalk in the middle where you press the button on the side and you can raise or lower your chair. You know, so it's got that yeah. stalk in the middle. They have a mini butt kicker specifically designed to attach right to that for computer users. So this this isn't unheard of by any means wanting to attach a tactile transducer. Okay, so we were talking about this a little bit beforehand and okay, all things being equal, theoretically, you're not cl connecting it improperly. I would do both the left <laughs> front and the left right or the front right speaker wire. Take those through so that you're getting it, this is assuming that the Logitech is not, does not have a crossover in that sub, that it says full range out to everything, uh, which is possible, though we don't know that for sure. You'd have to talk to Logitech yeah. to find out. Okay, all things being equal, I know, this is in theory. Uh, I, I would bet that it would be setting at a full range signal, which means that, that base is going to be in there someplace, okay? And therefore, you can strip it, or you can at least pick it up from that speaker wire as it's going through, uh, and then use it to f basically feed your plate amp. The problem is, A, we don't know if that's the case. B, there's very little power going through that speaker wire. These are extremely small, small speakers. They don't need a ton of power. So by putting it into a converter that's converting it from a low level or to, from a high level to low level, the speaker wire connection to something that can go into your amp, you are essentially, I mean, there's almost no power behind that at that point. Yeah, you're it's, asking that amplifier to amplify a lot because it's getting a very weak signal, and so you're asking it to do a lot of work to get that up to a usable level to move your tactile transducer. Yeah. Well, right. And the D sub doesn't help you at all because I looked for like some sort of way of stripping it out, and it would be a nightmare. Uh, it, it, it's a bit of a it's a it's a bit of a conundrum that you've gotten yourself into, without having something specific that you bought so that you could use it. I mean, really, what you need, sir, is a is a is a is, a, is an actual receiver. Uh, then this whole this whole thing would be solved. And yes. fr frankly, you get those for pretty cheap. But I'm assuming you can't do that. In which case, uh, it really seems like you've got to find a way to get the the base from your computer to the plate amp, not through the signal chain of uh, the Logitech. Yeah, I mean, uh, what Tom is saying, the easiest solution by far is to get yourself an inexpensive, regular AV receiver, 
5.180 receiver. You can still feed it the same optical connection, no problem there. And then the AV receiver can power your Logitech little satellite speakers directly. Um, I, well, there's no Not way to connect it to that Logitech subwoofer, though, yes. So it could power the tactile transducer directly, but then you'd have to have, you'd also have to buy a subwoofer. So that can accept a regular subwoofer output. So here's the thing. If you can, instead of using the optical output from your computer, use a 5.1 analog output. Now, on a computer, that'll usually take the form of three 3.5 millimeter little little plug stereo connections. So one will send out the left and right front, one will send out the left and right surrounds, and the third one will send out the center and subwoofer as a stereo signal using a 3.5 millimeter connection. Uh, on the back of your um, Logitech Z5500 control thing, the thing that has the volume knob on it, it has three analog inputs for this purpose so that you can send 5.1 analog audio out of your computer. Now, you'd have to be doing a little bit of splitting and splicing to make this all work, but what you would need to do is take the output that holds the center and subwoofer uh, signals in it, the analog output, um, you'd have to discover which side of that is the subwoofer output. That's not terribly hard. You can just connect it and hear which one is playing bass and which one's playing the vocals uh, in dialogue. Uh, but what you would need to do is take that 3.5 millimeter plug coming out of your um, out of your computer, change that to a uh, 3.5 millimeter to stereo RCA. So that's the white and red regular RCA plugs. You can then feed that subwoofer output directly into your um, tactile transducers amp. So there you go. We got that signal out of there using only the subwoofer signal. And you would actually want that to be a Y splitter cable so that then you can take that subwoofer RCA and the center RCA and recombine them back into a stereo 3.5 millimeter plug to plug into your Logitech's control center. Sounds more complicated than it is, but all we're doing is taking the center and subwoofer analog outputs from your computer, splitting it off, why splitting the subwoofer only side and then putting it back together and putting it back into the Logitech control center. That will work, but it depends on you having a 5.1 analog output from your computer. Don't know if he has that. Most computers do, but that is that is the correct way to do it, Mike, if you're able to do it. It's not really correct. It's the way that will work. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, this is still all kinds of wrong, this whole, this whole <laughs> situation here. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, that will get you to what you want. Uh, yeah, I, I I would maybe just 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 maybe sit on that tactile transducer for a while and let that collect dust while you're saving up money for some <laughs> real stuff. You know, I mean, I'm not I'm not saying I'm being on on you know, I it's something that you can look forward to. It's motivation for you to save money for your for your receiver and new SVS stuff, uh, actually, yeah, which will I, I make think, it uh, make that thing useless anyways. So I'll have to double go. check this, but I believe on on the butt kicker site they actually showed that exact connection path that I just described using the. Oh, the, we'll link that up in the show yeah, notes. I, I'll have I, I'm not 100 percent sure that they have that, but I, I seem to recall that they had that because they they gave you a bunch of crazy Y splitters and 3.5 to RCA adapter cables and all that kind of stuff. So that would uh, be I'm awesome. Sure they came up with the same. <laughs> if they just <laughs> did that, that would be awesome. Easier to picture than listen to my description. Although you can just listen to my w lovely words and my lovely voice over and over and over until it makes sense in your mind's eye. Yeah. Wow, that sounds like punishment for something I did in the past <laughs> line. All right, second, he, if he turns the volume up too quickly on his Z5500 control center, the volume stays quiet at first but then rises gradually. What's going on there? It's just some sort of delay. I mean, that's just part of how it works. I don't think that that's, there's anything wrong there. No, if, that, if, that's if, just, if you turn it and it doesn't go up, it's something's wrong. If you turn it and it goes up slowly, then some designer thought that that was a good idea. Yeah, that, that's just in that Logitech control center, the thing that sits on your desk and has the volume knob. That's just built into that. It's a quote-unquote feature. Hooray! Feature. Hooray! He thinks his separate plate amplifier might be clipping, but doesn't have any sort of LED clipping indicator. How can you make sure that his plate his amplifier does not clip. There is no chance that you're clipping that amplifier unless it's, I mean, I can't imagine a situation where, where that's happening. Well, the because the signal he's feeding it is so weak, uh, maybe it, he's got that thing cranked right up as high as it'll go and it's still yeah. doesn't move his tactile transducer. Well, that's what I was going to say. The only way, the only thing that's really going on here is that there's so little power coming in that, yeah, I don't, if you were giving this, I mean, the, a, a tactile transducer just doesn't take that much power. And most plate amplifiers will drive them without an 
issue, even though I don't know what the power is on this thing, I can't think of a situation where it would be an issue unless it's because the signal coming in is so weak. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'll bet you what's happening is his tactile transducer simply is not moving nearly as much as he would like it to. And that is a twofold thing that's going on. First of all, the weakness of the signal. And second of all, you're only feeding it the left front speaker's signal, which means that anytime the bass is not in the left front speaker, or if the Logitech system actually is employing a crossover and filtering oh, they, out most yeah. of the bass, then yeah. yeah, your tactile transducer is not going to be moving much because it's not getting much of a signal. So if that's what you're worried about and you're thinking, oh, it might be, it's, maybe it's clipping and that's why it's not moving. Nope, that, that's not the case. It's just not getting much of a signal. So yeah. I think that's what's happening. Feel it. If it's a hot, <laughs> then you've got a problem, okay? <laughs> that would be my first indication. I would not worry about whether or not it was clipping. I would worry about whether or not my couch was on fire. Uh, Raul has some... Yeah, I think we can answer Raul, and then I think uh, we can do your, your pricing thing, and I think oh, yeah. we will have to leave Jonathan's other questions till next week. Yep, and Jonathan... Uh... Yeah, okay. Raul uh, is trying to decide if 720p resolution will be a problem for his planned front projection setup. He has a 32-inch 720p LCD, and he tried an experiment by sitting only 48 inches away from it, which is 1.5 times the diagonal screen size. He'd like, to, he'd like to know if what he saw in this experiment is a good representation of what he might see in an 80 to 90-inch projection screen using a 720p projector, viewed from about 11 feet, uh, about 11 feet 6 inches away, about 11 and a half feet away, which is roughly the same 1.5 times diagonal screen size. Uh, I think it's a really good idea. Uh, I don't think that you're seeing what you're going to be seeing is exactly the same. Uh, frankly, you know, the, the, the space between the pixels on a, a direct view television is much more defined than the space between the pixels and the front projection setup, but there's a little bit more of a bleed. So I would think that if you sat there and went, that looks pretty good, uh, and you're not seeing any pixels, you're not seeing any screen door effect, then uh, then I would feel very confident that you would not see that with a front projection setup. Uh, conversely, if you saw, if you noticed a little bit of a screen door effect, unless it was so pronounced that you were like it was like a big deal, I would think that there was still going to be a chance that it wasn't you weren't going to notice it with the front projector. What do you think, Rob? Yeah, um, you know, yeah, you can't really just take raw resolution and say that's the thing that's going to determine whether you can see pixels or not, because it's all about the gap between the pixels. Um, so in a direct view LCD television, you have to remember that you now have those, um, you know, 1280 by 720 pixels spread out across the entire size of that screen, which is 32 inches diagonal in this case. When it's a projector, you have the same number of, number of pixels, but they're all crushed into a little chip that's about 1.5 inches in size. That's like the size of the chip that's inside the projector. So it's way tinier. Each individual pixel is way tinier, and the gap between each pixel is way tinier. It's not being spread out to actually physically fill the whole size. And then, of course, that image is being blown up many, many multiple times the size of that little chip. But what I'm getting at is you, you can't really look at the LCD TV and say, oh, yes, I will see the exact same. No, no, no. Screen no. Door you will not see the exact yeah, same. Yeah, it's, it, it's not really a one-to-one -one correlation there. But... If you're looking at a 720p 32 inch LCD from 48 inches away and you're going, eh, that doesn't look that bad, a projector's not going to look any worse. No, uh, no, for sure it's not going to look any worse. In fact, I, yeah, I would say it would look, look better. better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that does that. All right. So, like I said at the very beginning of the podcast, not getting uh, somewhere near the beginning of the podcast, that uh, there's something called accommodation pricing, and this is in this is in many industries, and it's in the AV industry as well. So, uh, yay, we paid off all our debts except for our house, which is the Dave Ramsey thing. Uh, I'm supposed to do some sort of scream. I don't do that. I mean, I scream, but only at my children. So. Uh, no, but uh, I, we paid off all our debts. So I told I, I mentioned last week that I was thinking about getting a receiver. Well, somebody said to me, "Well, why don't you look into accommodation pricing?" So I 
contacted Denon, and Gene contacted Denon for me, and I, I followed up with him as well. And uh, I thought accommodation pricing was sort of this like under the table, sort of, yeah, you know, you know somebody, you know somebody, and you get your receiver like off the back of the truck sort of thing. But that's not what it is at all. In fact, they, Denon has a special website set up for it, and you have to get a permission to use it, and once you get permission to use it, then you can go and shop their accommodation pricing. And this is for the industry, people within the industry to, to, to buy stuff, uh, you know, uh, and in my case, it's it works out really well because now I have I'll have something new to talk to talk about on the podcast, and Denon gets uh, for the price of them not making as much profit as they normally would, or maybe not making any profit. I don't know what the, the margins are there. They uh, they get their their product into the hands of somebody who uh, theoretically uh, has some influence. Now. So I went and I started looking at the pricing because I had already been pricing receivers a lot for uh, members of the podcast on Accessories for Less, which is the B site uh, refurb site that's uh, fully authorized to resell and has full manufacturer's warranties and everything else. And I was absolutely shocked. I was blown away by the similarities or how close the prices were to this quote unquote because because to me accommodation pricing was this sort of fabled thing where like you know you could get these 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 high priced pieces of gear for next to nothing which seemed you know like a sort of uh, unicorn you know white elephant sort of thing it's not that you know the, the prices are certainly better than uh, than uh, retail but if you ever wanted to feel like if, if you ever thought to yourself, oh well, you know that those those Davy Grant guys or Audioholics guys can get such great prices or you know all this other stuff, if you're going to accessories for less, you are getting uh, you're getting insider prices. That's exactly what you're getting. You're getting insider prices over there, and the prices. In, it, from what I, the little bit of research I did with it, and I was kind of like comparing the different receivers. At as if you get if you get a real popular one, the your, your accessories for less prices aren't as good. But if you get one that's, and it, and it tends to be better the higher up you go in price point. So the higher the price point goes, the closer you're getting to that absolute industry insider price. So it blew my mind. It absolutely blew me away when I looked at this because I thought I thought I was going to be getting something going to be like ha 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 I'm only this is going to be such a good deal I'm not even going to be able to talk about it well I can't talk about it because it's basically almost exactly the same as accessories for less price so I'm gonna I ordered a new uh, Denon uh, X4000 mm -hmm. so that'll be coming my way very soon uh, the downside of ordering it directly from Denon is that they seem to be in absolutely no rush to actually send it to me. So uh, I ordered it like four, five days ago, four days ago, and it's still in process. So I'm just about ready to strangle somebody. I'm like, ship the damn thing already. Even though I can't use it, I just want to hold it. Right? I just want to have it in the house. You want to be like Lee. You just want to open it and smell it. I want to smell it. That's right. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I thought that was a pretty cool thing, and it really kind of reinforced uh, like what we've been doing on this podcast, which you know we've been value shopping for people, we've been trying to help people out by finding them the best deals, and uh, it's it pretty much it it pretty much reinforced what we've been doing, and and that we've been doing the we've been on the right the right track there. So accessories for less website. I am now 120 percent behind. If I wasn't already 120 percent behind that site, I am definitely now. The last thing I did want to mention too is that it, I, don't, I don't know if it's hit Audioholics yet, so I'm going to check real quick. But uh, Audioholics just reviewed the new uh, the new subwoofer from uh, RBH. Ah yes, yeah, yeah. I saw that. I read that today. Yeah, the SX twelve 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 P P R seriously P R uh, yeah ported uh, slash reference. That's what that stands for. Yeah. Anyways, it's a dual twelve inch sub with a uh, a down firing. Uh, so that the both twelve inch drivers are firing forward. There's a down firing port. It somehow managed to hit twelve point five hertz in room. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. It's also a six-inch port. That's like one of the bigger ports I've ever seen. Normally yeah. They divide that up into like two ports, but nope, they're like one six-inch, well, just flared on both ends port. Yeah. It, so uh, apparently, it's uh, it's not it's not cheap. It's uh, no. there's a passive version and an active version. The active version has got like a 2,400 watt amp. It's 5,300 bucks. The passive version is 2,300 dollars. 
Uh, I actually looked online, and you can find some fairly crazily powered uh, pro amps that have DSPs and everything for like less than 500 bucks. I don't know how well they'll match with this, uh, but they'll have like 3,000 watts, you know, per, per channel for two channels or something ridiculous like that. And but this thing apparently destroyed anything else as far as just raw output. Uh, sure. it, really just uh, I guess they're extreme uh, the, the audioholics extreme uh, extreme rating was uh, destroyed so I wanted to see what the, exactly what, how, what the maximum output was here but uh, it was hitting, I think it was hitting over 120 DB everywhere above 30 Hertz yeah that's and what that, that was outdoors from two meters away so <laughs> It's, you know, it's got some output. It's got a little bit of output. <laughs> and frankly, compared to some of the other subs that we've seen, that are, and really for, you know, if you get the passive one and then supply your own amplification, as long as you get something that's going to work, you can almost buy two for the price of one mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and still have an amp and uh, Dude, really destroy it. <laughs> and then start looking into new windows, new walls. Yeah, we... What's his name? Won't have to worry about his uh, his projector vibrating anymore because it will be on the floor, <laughs> you know that sort of thing. So, all right. This really is for a very large theater. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty. On, on that subwoofer tip, I'll mention uh, SVS just tweeted out today that uh, they are now shipping Piano Black uh, 2000 series subwoofers. So oh yeah, who was asking there? about that? Who I, somebody was asking uh, about that a couple of months yeah, back? I forget the name now, but anyway, yes, Piano Black is now available for the 2000 series. Told you. There we go. Told you. All right. <laughs> <sighs> All right. So uh, you have a recommendation on this list. You want to make it real quick? Yeah, sure. Since we were talking about uh, calculating uh, how much amplifier powers and stuff you need, uh, Brent Butterworth over at uh, stereos.about.com, he put up a nice uh, article with uh, five uh, short little equations, audio-related equations that might come in handy. Uh, now, I mean, the first one there is converting watts into decibels, which might sound like exactly what we were talking about. It's not quite. This is when you have one amplifier and you want to compare it to a second amplifier. Um, you know, so one of them is rated at 100 watts per channel and the other one is rated at 150 watts per channel and you want to figure out how many more decibels that extra 50 watts is getting you. So it's those type of equations, short little ones, um, not quite so as... So you're normally using three watts at a time? Not a lot! <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, some helpful little ones. So he's got that one, uh, figuring out how much uh, current your amp puts out, uh, converting RMS into peak power, uh, root mean square into peak power, um, converting volts into decibels. Again, that's one amp compared to another, and figuring out the wavelength of an audio frequency in air, although there are very easy online calculators for that. Uh, but anyway, some handy things, so I'll put up the link to that. It's kind of useful and fun. All right, and my recommendation is the Harmony Ultimate Remote. So there you go. <laughs> Yay, me. All right. All right. You can contact us at uh, Rob at AV Rant, uh, Tom at AV Rant. You can come to the website, uh, avrant.com, and uh, comment there. Go to facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. It's all one word. On uh, Twitter, at First Reflect for Rob and at avrant underscore Tom for me. Send us all your AV and home theater questions. We will answer them. Uh, and... Uh, Maybe we might actually have a podcast that doesn't go two hours next week if we don't get too many questions. It might. If we only get as many as actually came in this week, we only have Jonathan. Again, apologies to Jonathan uh, to hold over till next week. So, you know, you know, maybe maybe it'll be a... Well, I have a, a question half, from Miles. A podcast or something. I have a question from Miles in my inbox right now. So, Miles is going to be on the list. We All right. Too. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. All right, guys, starting to go hang out in about uh, five, six minutes. Bye.